The following program is made possible with support from the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation. Welcome to Science Goes to the Movies, a look at the stories of science and how they change our culture. I'm Faith Saley. And I'm Heather Berlin. We're going to be reviewing current movies, TV shows, and sometimes checking out a blast from the past, but from a scientific point of view. Today, we're going to talk about consciousness, artificial intelligence, and what it means to be human. These issues are addressed in Alex Garland's new film, Ex Machina. In Ex Machina, a young computer code writer working at a massive online search engine wins his company's raffle and is invited to spend a weekend at his CEO's private retreat. Once there, he discovers that he's been hand-selected by the CEO to conduct a Turing test on the CEO's newly constructed artificial intelligence. How do you feel about her? Oh, man, she's amazing. You're impressed? <laughs> yes. Do you want to be my friend? Of course. Now the question is, how does she feel about you? Do you think about me when we are together? Did you give her sexuality as a diversion tactic? This is your insecurity talking. This is not your intellect. Bye. Did you know that I was brought here to test you? <laughs> does Ava actually like you? Or was she pretending to like you? Nathan, isn't your friend I'm wrong? I'm wrong about what? Everything. Do you want to be with me? Can we talk about the lies you've been spinning me? What lies? What lies? You have to help me. You have to help me. We're joined today by fellow neuroscientist Christoph Koch. Christoph is the chief scientific officer of the Allen Institute for Brain Science in Seattle, Washington, and studies the neural basis of consciousness. So, Christoph, what is the neural basis of consciousness? What's the footprints of consciousness? And by consciousness here we mean sort of any experience. The experience of being you, the experience of being happy, the experience of seeing, the experience of feeling that I'm, I'm the person responsible for lifting my arm. And what is the basis of that in the brain? We know it's not the liver. We know, unlike previous cultures, we know it's not your heart. So when you say you have an experience of love, it's your brain that has that experience. But what is it about the brain that gives rise to this experience of love? As neuroscientists, um, uh, dealing with the basis of neural consciousness, did you see that reflected in this movie, Ex Machina? It's less about the neural basis. Mm. I mean, they're very short on detail. Right? They once show the brain mm. of Eva, right? And they sort of suggest that it's a sort of bioengineered brain, but they don't really talk at all about the basis of, of consciousness, if, if she does have consciousness. It's more about the question, does she behave to you like a human? Does she look like a human? Do you feel she's human? Do you feel she has feelings? Yeah, I think they skirted around the issue of the actual mechanisms or how this, this AI was actually working or made. It was sort of like, oh, we just programmed her that way. And yeah, exactly. The one scene where they show this sort of brain that they said can actually rewire itself or it can learn or it can kind of, you know, change according to like its input. So there was a little hint about it, but there was nothing about really the mechanisms or how they programmed it and how she was able to do these things and, and how she could interact so, you know, in such a human-like way. So since they kind of skirted that issue, you know, as, as a neuroscientist, did, does that create an obstacle for you in enjoying the film? Or were you like, okay, well, we'll skip this part and you could absorb the rest of it? I could absorb the rest. You know, so it doesn't deal with the non-essential details. What's essential for this movie is the question, is, does she have feelings? Does she really love Eva? Does she have feelings of compassion? Does she have feelings of lust? Those are the questions that the movie is about. Is, it, is that a different question than does it seem to me like she has feelings? Are those two Hell different yes. questions? Yeah. Are you in love with me or do you just pretend you're in love with right. me? It's all the difference. It's all the difference that matters for us. But the problem here is that she can act as if she's, let's say, in love or that she has feelings for someone. But if she actually really has those internal states is a different question. And I think that the Turing test doesn't really 
uh, get to the answer of that question. The only question it really gets at is, can she fool a human into believing, let's say, she has love? But whether yes, she really she has fooled, it... she fooled this human in watching the movie, yes. <laughs> but, you know, the character that was played by Nathan Isaac, he wasn't fooled, and that was because he was the creator of this machine. And so for some reason, he could see through it and wasn't really treating them as if they were human-like. You know, he was treating them as if they were objects. Whereas the other character who was there to do the Turing test was fooled and developed these feelings. I beg to differ because oh, really? Nathan was also fooled. Do you say Nathan, the creator, was fooled because he thought his creations would never betray him, would never turn on him? It w and would not have autonomy, wouldn't be capable of autonomous acting by themselves, have their own intention. And she very much has their own intention. Well, she wanted to get out of that prison. But that's a different way of being fooled. He wasn't fooled into believing that she was actually human. And that was his mistake because... He, he, she actually could have in, inner intentions and turn on him that wasn't programmed. So in a sense, he wasn't fooled into believing, you know, she was, he should have believed more so that she was more human-like um, versus being just an object. Well, clearly she's not human. I mean, if you look at her, right, you can see the whys, you can see the blinking lights inside her. Right? So clearly she's not human. But the question is, does she have feelings? And he, I think, was also misled because she does have feelings. She wants to get away. She wants to be her own person. She wants to stand on an intersection and just observe people going by, right? No, he was misled into thinking that she doesn't have feelings. The yes. other character was, misled, was well, not misled in this case. He, was, he thought that she did have feelings, and that's probably closer to the case. So you guys are talking about feelings, and you're, you're saying, Christoph, that she is not human, but she does have feelings. Yes. So feelings are not what make us human? No, that's a different question. The question is, can a non-human have feelings? Can a non-human have feelings? Yes. And when if, can, can a well well for some a dog right okay so let's, can a dog have can a, a non I was gonna say can a non biological creature but is an AI creature can, is an AI invention considered biological no it's not biologic I mean it's made by us but it's not biological okay it's so can a non biological designed. creature have feelings yes and that is the same that's identical to the question can a thing like that can a thing that that we build that didn't that didn't evolve can a thing that's built can have it Consciousness? Can it experience anything? Can it, can it have a feeling of desire? Can it have a feeling of, uh, of, of freedom, that it needs freedom? And your answer is? That depends on your theory of consciousness. But if we go back to the movie, how do we test that, right? So there was this British scientist, Alan Turing, a mathematician, right? So he, so he can be considered the father of our information age. And he invented to get around this question, how do you know whether a machine can think? He said, well, let's, let's have this test. All right, so you interact with this entity in another room over teletype, okay? So you, 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 know, you, you, and you chat with it, as it were. And then about any possible topic, about love or poetry or stars or how you feel today. And, and, and if after, let's say, an hour of conversation, you're unable to say for certain, well, this is clearly a program, or I'm not sure, it seems to behave like a human, well, then at least you have to admit this, this thing acts like an intelligent machine that seems to think. At one point in the film, the hero, Caleb, questions his own humanity. He wonders, am I a human or am I a robot? Should we all be questioning that? No. no. How do we, how, why not? How do we, how do I, I know? know. How? I know. How? Because I have direct, so for philosophers have this term, I have direct experience of my own conscious experience. And so that's a tragedy also of, of life. I never know your consciousness. I don't know mm -hmm. Heather's feelings. I don't know your feeling. All I can read your feeling what you say, the way you behave, right? But I have direct access to my own feelings. I know that I know. I know that I'm a man. I know I'm Christoph. I know I'm going to die. I know I see you. So the problem, I mean, the, the, one of the problems with, with studying consciousness, like in a scientific way, is that you, it really you can only get it. It's, it's this first person subjective experience. And it's very hard to measure, let's say, measure it in a lab. Because as Christoph said, you know, he knows he has it, but he doesn't know you have it or I have it. Um, but there's another philosopher named Dan Dennett. And he said, you know, sure, we have a soul. It's just made up of trillions of little tiny robots, right? Which basically is... Our, each cell in our brain is like a little tiny, you know, robot, right? Each one of it, each one in itself is not particularly conscious, but when they all sort of come together into this sort of machine, which is our, our brain and our body, it, it produces this subjective, this subjective feeling. But in a sense, we are, in, really, we are little, we are robots. We are these creatures that are, come pre-programmed. You know, we have instincts and drives, and even though they might have evolved well, over time. This is another discussion. It sounds yeah. like you, you, from a scientific point of view, you're saying there's no free will. 
Oh yeah, yeah, no. Okay. Well, that's yeah, another, that's another, another that's, wait, no, that's a whole other, that's a whole other. But you're saying we come well, programmed. We well, come I think programmed. we come with programs and we are made up of these little mechanisms, you know, these neurons, they have, they're, they have programmed to respond in particular ways. And somehow when they all come together in this complex system, it creates our subjective states. But in a sense, you could think of us as robots. We're just not man-made, you know. Oscar Isaac's character, Nathan, makes these robots who are naked, they look beautiful, bald, female, gorgeous, perfectly proportioned, and then he mistreats them. He's very cruel to them. So if they're not human, is he misogynistic? I think that what I was saying before is that because he created these, these, these objects, these sort of creatures, he, I think, just looks at them in a very objective way. So treating them however he may treat them, if he assumes that they don't necessarily have feelings, then, it, you know what does it matter? You know, if they actually do have subjective states and could, can feel, you know, like they're being used or, or mistreated, uh, then, then it is misogyny. But he sees them demonstrate that they do. I mean, these, these women. But he programmed them to act that way. So I guess, you know, where the audience is fooled, um, and, but the, the creator doesn't seem to be fooled by but what he created. But he chose created. to make them female, and he chose to make them stunning. And he chose, well, he's if, a male if indeed creator. he does program them in every way, he chose to make them subservient to him. Mm -hmm. So, so oh, Christoph, you're, you're, you're looking very serious and you're very quiet. <laughs> well, the question is all about, so ultimately it has to do, as Heather said, with experience. Do you think I can kick my, uh, my refrigerator? Do you, or do you think I'm doing some bad action if I burn my refrigerator, if I take a chainsaw to my, ref to my refrigerator? Is that there bad was a man who was arrested for, for shooting his computer a couple weeks ago, actually, because he got frustrated. So is it bad from an ethical point of view? I, I don't think so. Okay, so, so if I take a, a, a fridge that happens to look like a beautiful woman, is that bad? Is it because the, the machine now looks like a woman that makes it bad, or is it because... Well, you're it, asking it me experience. questions, and yeah. I, I certainly have a, opinions. I mean, I, I think he is misogynistic because he chooses to make his creations ob objective, and he chooses to mistreat them. And, and in every way, I don't know, you'll have to tell me, he, he, he gives gender to his creation, um, at least superficially, right? Um, so to me, it does seem misogynistic. Does it to you? You're asking me rhetorical questions. Does it to you? Yes, it's certainly misogynistic, but that's not the question I care about. I care much more about the question, uh, ultimately, if, if Eva has conscious experiences, then she has the same moral right that you or I have. Because ultimately, I think ethical considerations have to revolve around the ability of this thing to experience the world, to experience pain, to experience pleasure, to experience the fullness of the world. That's ultimately what any ethics has to be. So if it's true that this, that this thing, this entity, Eva, has conscious experience, then she has to be accorded the same rights as any other system. And then, yes, of course, what's, what's being done to her is, is, uh, is very cruel. Ex Machina is a great film, and it's a great film in good company. There's lots of AI films to pick from, and we've chosen the 1982 film Blade Runner, based on Philip K. Dick's story, Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep? In the film, replicant hunter Harrison Ford is tasked with eliminating four escaped androids. But before he can do that, he, as in Ex Machina, is asked to run a Turing test on a girl named Rachel. Would you step out for a few moments, Rachel? Thank you. She's a replicant, isn't she? I'm impressed. How many questions does it usually take to spot one? I don't get it, Tyrell. How many questions? 20, 30 cross-referenced. It took more than 100 for Rachel, didn't it? She doesn't know. She's beginning to suspect, I think. Suspect? How can it not know what it is? Commerce is our goal here at Tyrell. More human than human is our motto. Rachel is an experiment, nothing more. So 30 years later, and we're still worried about the same things. Why do you, why do you think that that's so? I'm not worried that you're a robot. <laughs> <laughs> I actually, I'm not. Why do you think society yeah. is, is filled with fear 
um, about this, about the robots, about robots among us. Okay, so I dispute that they're filled with fear. It does cause some anxiety because we're closer in creating these creatures than we were 30 years ago. It will happen probably within the, you know, uh, this century. And that leaves us a, you know, there's sort of fear of being displaced, right? Because after all, the reason we're the dominant species is not because we are faster or we are stronger, or certainly not because we are wiser, but we are more intelligent, we are smarter. If now we build creatures that are as smart as us, or maybe possible smarter, right, where does it leave us? Where does it leave our jobs? Where does it leave ultimately our existence? And then, of course, we also worry, you know, do, about consciousness and soul. You know, if, do we have a soul? Then, or do they also have a soul? Maybe neither of us have souls. Where does it leave our image of who we are? You know, do you guys think about those questions? Yes, I think I about do. them all the time. You do? Yeah. And do you, and do you have an answer? Like do you think do you think we have a soul? We don't have a soul. So I grew up as a in, in a Roman Catholic, devout Roman Catholic family, so certainly there's no evidence whatsoever for any sort of soul. It's also logically sort of contradictory with anything with everything we know about the universe. I would say like Killing yeah, as a, as a neuroscientist. My name's Faith, you guys. <laughs> <laughs> This is something I've, of course, thought a lot about. It's one of the reasons why I became a neuroscientist, because I was fascinated with this idea of do we have a soul and where does it come from? And, and where does it go? Where does it go? And, you know, when I watch people go down under anesthesia, you know, one minute they're all conscious and alive. You, they go under. The, where did they go? And then we can wake them up. Even when you go to sleep into, a, you know, a deep, dreamless sleep, where are you? And, and how do you come back up again? And why is it that one day you don't return again? And so... I, that's why I became fascinated with how the brain works, because I thought, you know, that it's we, who we are, as we, we experience ourselves in this world, is all based in these neurons firing. So as a neuroscientist and as someone who wants there to be a soul, um, you know, I haven't found any evidence to support that. Uh, however, as a human being, I have my own personal subjective feelings. And even though I know how the brain works, well, vaguely speaking, I still am fooled by it, and I still, you know, feel that there must be something else, and I am hopeful that there is. But as a scientist, and my scientist cap on, I'd say there no soul. As a human being, you know, perhaps, or I'd like there to be. At the end of Blade Runner, the replicant Roy Batty, played by Rucker Hauer, catches Harrison Ford's Deckard just as he's about to fall, saving his enemy's life, proving that even as an AI, he understands the value of life. I've seen things. You people wouldn't believe. <laughs> Attack ships on fire off the shoulder of Orion. I watched sea beams glitter in the dark near the Ten Hours of Gate. All those moments will be lost in time. Like tears in rain. Time to die. that's the most yeah. poetic scene I've ever seen in any science fiction film that there is. Well, that's why it remains one of the most famous monologues or soliloquy about death in any movie, yes. And you know it by heart, don't you, Christoph? Yes, I even remember where I was when I, when I, when I first heard it. Well, because it speaks... Where were you? Uh, I was in Pasadena in a bedroom. I remember exactly the detail of the bedroom. Because it speaks, it struck me so vividly because it speaks to all of our lives. Because, you know, it's one day you'll also be in this situation where you have all these wonderful memories, you know, of the sea beams glittering in the dark at Ten House Gate. They will be your memories and all those moments will disappear like tears in the rain. You said that, Christoph, you see Blade Runner at least once a year? Uh, yeah, because, yes, I see it often. Why? I talk about it with my friends. Most of my friends are big fans as well. Well, because it, it has... Uh, 
it has this, this vision of life, it has this dystopian view also, it's about in t um, um, consciousness and, and intelligence, sort of the, the themes of my, of my research. It's just an, it's a work of, it's a great work of art, like any work of art, like an opera or painting, you often go back and revisit it, because given, uh, given on your situation in life where you are right now, you always see something new, you pick, some, you pick out something new, you understand something different about it. Howard's character Roy says to Ford's Deckard, quite an experience to live in fear, isn't it? Quite an experience to live in fear, isn't it? That's what it is to be a slave. So if machines develop consciousness and, and we still make them work for us, are they our slaves? I mean, is this push towards artificial intelligence the creation of a brand new slave class? In pre it, it, it depends what your view on these machines is. If you believe that these machines are actually fully conscious, then yes, we have to ask ourselves the question, can we misuse them? Can we abuse them? Can we turn them off? Can we wipe the disks clean? Isn't that like losing a memory? Or are they just like an overgrown refrigerator that's just after all a you know, chunk of metal and uh, it's just an object? So the big question, is it an object or is it a subject? And I, and I also think it depends on exactly if they have subjective states. So if they are, let's say we've built one that is, you know, cleans our house. And if they're programmed to do that and they don't think of any other thing in life than to clean your house, I think it's fine. If they start having subjective feelings or states of, I want to be doing something else, I want to be free, and we don't allow them to, then it becomes a form of slavery. But I really think in reality what's, what's going to happen is, wait, and by the way, if that's the case, if they have these subjective states, there'll have to be all sorts of raw laws and rules that are developed, you know, to protect the, their rights. But I think in reality, we're really becoming slaves to them. I mean, we're a slave to our iPhone, you know, we're a slave to our, if our computer breaks down, if we lose our iPhone, we lose all of our phone numbers, we lose all of our data, or our papers, our information. So in a way, I think it's gonna turn out to be the opposite case, where we're kind of these little, you know, subservient creatures to the, to the technology. Over the years, there has been continued debate over whether Harrison Ford's character Deckard was written to be a human or a replicant. Major players on the production team still disagree about this. Harrison Ford and producer Michael Dealey think he's human, while director Ridley Scott says he's a replicant. So how do we know our own humanity is not just some kind of artificial construct? I'm not worried about it, about myself. Because <laughs> I have access to my own feelings and I know the reality of these feelings. We are, as I said, we are, we are programmed in a way to have certain feelings and we have certain illusions that we all have that are very hard to fight, visual illusions. Uh, of that's when you say we are programmed, the question is by whom? By genetics but. and, you know, by our, our genome. But, but, you know, I mean, the... the, the we're partially programmed. Yeah, there are certain yeah. things we like to do and certain things we don't like to do, but we're not fully programmed. Nobody predicted that right now I was going to raise my hand. Well, if I had electrodes on your brain and was looking at your brain activation, I might have been able to predict that well before you were consciously aware of that. That's the whole question of free will, which is another question, right, altogether. But, but I mean, you know, we could be living in the matrix. That is actually a possibility. I think it's a very slim chance that we are, you know, and, and whether we're programmed by a, a god or a creator or, you know, uh, in that case in the film, you know, the, the Google oh. guy. But real. How often does your iPhone break down? Constantly, right? Humans and we break down. We live in this perfect simulation. Come yeah, on. Computers break down. Yeah, we break down all the time too. I mean, we're not humans. Are not far from perfect. But I think it's unlikely. I don't think we were made by a creator, but we are. We are definitely programmed by our genetic, by our the genome to have certain likes, to have certain. Even in the film, in Ex Machina, he said, "Oh yeah, I programmed her to be heterosexual." Aren't you programmed to be heterosexual? You know, you didn't make a choice at some point that you're going to like women. You just were programmed to like them. And so I think we are, in a way, already. It is true. We are much less free than we like to believe. Yes, very much so. And much of our conscious explanation about why we do things is, is not correct. We come up with post hoc explanations mm -hmm. about why we do things all the time. And science and, and neuroscience and psychology is, is, is definitely have many experiments to show that. And also that our brain makes decisions well before we are consciously aware of the decisions we're making. So that definitely brings into a question of free will. On a less philosophical note, do you think Deckard is a human or replicant? No opinion. Truly, oh. no opinion. I've well, thought a lot about it. I I haven't made up my mind because there's evidence on both sides. I feel that he's a human, but I I would say human just because of the fact that he seems to show emotions and empathy and feelings. And unless they got to the point where they can, you know, 
make these replicants so that they actually have these subjective states, which it seems like they've gotten to that point. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I'm on the side of human. human. I mean, you realize, Faith, that sooner or later we will come to this point, you know, say 20 years, 50 years, 100 years or 200 years, we will come to this point where there are entities that interact with us. You can speak to them. You can speak to them just like you can speak to your kid or your husband or to your friend or to your secretary. And we'll all have to make collectively, each one of us, and collectively as a society, the decision, are these just software and hardware contracts that we can buy and sell and bundle and delete? Or do they have rights? Do, do, do they have experiences? This will come to pass. This is, these are huge questions. I saw, I saw the rebooted Battlestar Galactica, and I'm, I'm scared. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the future is an unknown country, and not all, not all the futures are necessarily beneficial for us or for our, for our survival. Um, that is a, a, a very elliptical, eerie note on which to end. Um, <laughs> but I think, I think maybe you would say if someone wants to seek comfort, just curl up in, in some room and watch Blade Runner again. Right? Yes. Right, Christoph? <laughs> or it's okay. You know, we can all be friends, the computers, the humans. I well, mean, that's why not, not clear whether we can all be friends. <laughs> we even have difficulty being friends with people from other parties or other countries or other religious beliefs. So why do we believe? that we have this radical different entities that have radical different goals that we should sort of peacefully coexist. Maybe yes, maybe no, we don't know. We just should proceed cautiously in this direction. But right now we're rushing headlong towards this. Thank you so much for coming by, Christoph. Thank you, Faith, for her and Heather for having me. Don't forget to check us out on the web at cuny.tv under the Science tab, where you'll find past shows, additional content, and a link to our app. <laughs>